It's exciting to be here today and share with you what is a pretty special day around the world. I mean, if over 130 nations in the world take one day of the year to celebrate not just mothers, but this understanding of the importance of mothering love, then there's something really significant going on today. And that's what we want to have a conversation about from our varying, varying perspectives, her as a psychologist, and I'll kind of look at it from more of a theological or, or, or scriptural perspective, and we'll weave those two things together in a relatively informal conversation. But because it's informal doesn't mean it's not important. Because you see, this is far beyond, yes, it's, it's really important to, even in symbolic ways, give uh, some flowers, acknowledge, take some space to say what you're doing and what you're expressing is supremely important. But this isn't just a day uh, in the middle of Lent coming out of your, trans, uh, you know, you know, your context and your tradition. By the way, how does that work, a feast day in the middle of Lent? I thought, like, can you give up fasting for Lent? Can you, I mean, I'm into that, if, if you can... <laughs> You can give that up, but, uh, but just that whole tradition uh, that began to say in the middle of this period of, of just setting things aside so we can get a more clear perspective, we want, we want to really focus in on the importance of this. Uh, we need to celebrate these things, but we're also very aware, not just theoretically, but of a, out of our own experience that often for many, and not just other people, but people for us in this room, this is an extremely painful day. Because this world is not just beautiful, it's also broken. And, and in this most central of relationships, often there's a fracture that creates deep pain and deep loss and confusion and, and, and creates a chasm that we think, can this ever be filled? Can it can the parts ever be brought back together? Uh, when I talk about this kind of pain, why don't you unpack a little, at least, what we're talking about here? Well, I mean, first of all, hello, everyone. <laughs> um, I must apologize for my South African accent, but I am told that it's wonderful. So here goes. I'm about to bless you. <laughs> Sorry. Back to serious business. So. Yes, um, Mother's Day is, it's a, it sort of produces in you a mixed bag of emotions, um, you know, in a sense, um, you know, I lost my mom uh, three weeks before my, my first son was born, my first child was born, um, and she was my age now, currently, uh, when she passed away. And so every day, uh, Mother's Day, you know, it brings up this tremendous sadness for me. Um, I've lost my mother. I can't celebrate her. And I'm sure that many of you are in the same situation. Um, there's also a sense of, of, of loss, um, not just um, through death, but there can be mothers who have lost babies um, or, or adults, um, children. So there's also a sense of, I don't have a child to celebrate me on Mother's Day. Um, you know, there's also broken relationships. You, you might not get on with your mom very well. Um, or mothers have broken relationships with their children. And so when Mother's Day comes around, it's a sense of bringing that to the fore. And you remember, I've, I've failed, or, or you feel a sense of shame or guilt. And there is that thing, mother's guilt. You know, we carry around with us guilt, no matter what we do and how well we do it, we just have guilt. Uh, and then there's also those that were not able to be mothers. Uh, you may not have been able to conceive, and so you have that sense of, of missing out on life. Um, there's also, obviously, the emotions of delight and joy that motherhood brings. So let's not forget that. But it's also important to remember that. Um, yeah, not nurturing love is really at the heart of what we need to be able to fully live. 
Yeah. Yeah, I mean, of course, I'm, I'm a man. What do I know about that? But I remember the incredible powerlessness watching my my daughter, who had been a midwife in the slums of the Philippines, delivered over a hundred babies, and all she ever wanted to be was a mom. And I watched her um, lose four babies later in pregnancy. And just the agony uh, and, and the frustration I had with God. I remember this was a season where I was had the privilege of watching so many miraculous healings and powerful things that God seemed to be able to do. And, and yet it seemed that nothing could rescue my daughter from that. And I remember one time just falling on the floor and said, like, God, I'm done. I, I, if, if you're not going to take care of my daughter, I, 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 I'm, I'm done doing this stuff. Like, I watched the agony as the greatest longing and desire of her heart just couldn't be fulfilled. And, and the agony that we all felt, taking these little, they're all boys, building little boxes and burying them, you know. And this is, this is, these are the kinds of issues. And of course, what we're talking about really only scratches the surface of what a lot of people experience. And, but the reason why it's so deep and it's so painful, because it strikes, as Lise was just saying, at the heart of something that is absolutely essential for us to ever fully live. This thing we call mothering love, this nurturing love, is we can't live without it. I mean, when I say it's foundation, I'll unpack that a little bit more, at least from the perspective of a, of a psychologist. Well, I, I suppose that, you know, a mother is everything. Um, when, that, when she conceives... Um, that baby is getting everything from her. You know, her diet, her, whether she's exercising or not, how much she's sleeping. Um, everything that the mother does is feeding into that unborn baby. Um, so it's physiological that baby is being formed because of the mother. It's, I mean, and, and the father, obviously. But um, psychologically, um, and emotionally, you know. Um, what they're finding, or what they have found through research, is that the, the hormones that the mother experiences or produces during the pregnancy filters through to the baby um, in different ways. So, for instance, if a mother is extremely stressed, there's a lot of cortisol in her system, uh, which does go through to the baby. Um, that has profound effects on the child. Because if you think about it, all the neurons in the brain are being formed. And those neurons is what later leads to the neural pathways, which is basically our thoughts. Um, and so these are being formed in pregnancy. Um, and so basically, the mother is providing the soil from which children's thinking patterns develop. Um, so if she's extremely stressed, the baby's going to actually be experiencing a little bit of that stress. Now, it's not all bad because it actually can be a protective, uh, form of protective uh, function in that we do live in stressful, you know, a stressful world. So we're actually building a baby to survive in a stressful world, which is a bit sad, but that just is the way it is. Um, yeah, and I mean, if, if they've also found that there's a link between too much stress hormone and um, later on for the child developing um, emotional difficulties like um, depression or anxiety and also ADD, attention deficit and dyslexia. And I'm not trying to heap on uh, more mother guilt. Um, as I said, it does perform a, 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 perform a protective measure, so, so it's not all bad. Yeah, but there, there is a generational effect. We live in, in brokenness. We're incomplete. We're, uh, you know, uh, often it's, we're expecting the, the people that have never been mothered to some, suddenly become mothering. Uh, and... 
And it's amazing how much intuitively happens. I think society has always intuitively understood, at least mothers, fathers less so, of how essential this is for the fabric of our collective well-being, of, of how we can live well and live together in relationship. But sadly, if we look back into the 20th century, the, the 1900s, in the early part of that century, we, we really saw a dramatic advance in science, and that brought a lot of wonderful things, and a lot of new understandings and new awareness. For instance, germ theory, beginning to recognize how uh, you know, sanitation could really create a difference in our quality of life. But, but unfortunately, some of the early understandings of science really turned parenting in a way that perhaps wasn't as helpful as it could have been. One of the things about germs, it started to create a, a, a greater detachment, sort of like we, we don't want to touch our kids as much. We want to make sure we're not, we're not infecting them with all these, these, these terrible germs, but with not an, an awareness of how absolutely essential all of that touch was. But probably much more important than that was an early uh, psychological understanding of human relationship and, and parenting called behaviorism. Now, most of us in early science classes learned about Pavlov's dog and how you could teach it to salivate by ringing a bell. And, and, and so people thought, well, gee, if that can work for Pavlov's dog, what about Johnny? You know, what about... Uh, uh, what about Mary Jane, you know? And, and uh, sadly, there was this pretty prominent psychologist named John B. Watson. And he actually said something this, that was this audacious. He said, this is 1928, children are built, not born. Give me the baby, I'll make it climb and use its hands in constructing buildings of stone or wood. I'll make it a thief, a gunman, or a dope fiend. The possibilities of shaping in any direction are almost endless. What we started thinking was, if we just do this, then we get this. And, and so what began to develop, and it really impacted me because it was my parents' generation that wholesale adopted. They never really heard about Watson or really even behaviorism, but it was very common to make sure that children were never spoiled that they were always put on rigid schedules. No, it's not time for feeding yet. You know, it's kind of like what I remember when I was visiting Russia just after it opened up many, many years ago. And it was a hot, hot spring day. And maybe 80, you know, that was Fahrenheit, like maybe, you know, it's almost 30 degrees. And yet inside the apartments, the heat was blazing. And I said, like, can't you turn off the heat? They said, no, it's, it's, it's central to the whole city. I said, well, can't they turn it off? No, because it's not the date to turn the heat off yet. Mm. Right? And, and so it's just the way. This is the date in which we do things. There was this thing of, you know, let that child cry themselves to sleep. Let, because we want to create this child that's attuned to the way our modern society is working. With little understanding of what was taking place and what was being lost and missed in the development of healthy human beings. And it wasn't probably until the 50s and 60s that other psychologists began to do some experiments and began to realize the damages that, we, that was being done and how important it was that this primary connection would be established and solidified in the hearts of every child. So in, I think it was in the 50s or was it the 60s? Uh, I think it was the 50s that um, Harry Harlow, he was a psychologist at the University of Wisconsin, uh, he did an experiment um, using infant monkeys, baby monkeys. And he had a, had, had a cage with two different mother figures. One was a, a wire mother figure with a bottle and the other was a, um, a soft fabric warm mother figure. And um, they would starve these baby monkeys, which is a terrible thing to do. Ah, yeah, research has come a long way. Um, and they would starve the baby monkey and then they would let the baby monkey go into this cage. 
and the baby monkey would immediately go to the warm, soft, cuddly mother figure. Um, and it would actually starve itself up to about 18 hours before it would kind of run to the bottle, quickly take a few sips, and then run back to the soft, cuddly, warm mother. So, so basically, um, he sort of said that our, our mothers are not really important to us to feed us. They're there to cuddle us, and that's what's important about a mother. And Harlow influenced uh, John Bowlby, who then developed attachment theory um, and basically said that our early attachments with mother and father are what shape us in terms of our adult relationships. So um, there are three different types of attachment which Ainsworth um, developed, and they're secure, anxious, and avoidant. I can see some of you nodding, so some of you know about attachment theory. Um, so, but I'll just quickly explain. So secure attachment is basically when, with a baby, mom leaves the room, baby becomes distressed and cries. Mom comes back, baby is soothed and is fine, carries on confidently. Uh, with anxious attachment, the mother will leave the baby, baby will get distressed and cry, mother comes back, baby continues to cry and be distressed and, and takes a long time to soothe. With the avoidant, mother leaves baby, baby becomes distressed, cries, but when mother returns, baby ignores her. Um, and, and avoids her, and um, sort of shuts down in a way. So it would be really good for all of us to know what kind of an attachment um, we generally play out in our relationships with our partners, um, because that would be a signal as to what we had in our early, early years. So it'd be good to educate yourself on, on what that is. And at times it can be one or two. Um, so some of us sort of vacillate between secure or secure, anxious or secure and avoidant. Um, so basically mothers and fathers, because fathers are, it is really important that fathers are added to this, um, teach our children how to attach and how to love later on in life. Now, this isn't just a theory. The, the, the great struggle that we all know we, under, we understand that we have is how do we relate? How do we love and be loved? And, and it, it's the problems we have basically stem way back to this initial bonding or lack of bonding, this connection or lack of connection. And then as a result of that experience, we act in certain kinds of ways, and then as life becomes difficult, we just double down on the way that we've figured out how to do things. And what really is required is not just sort of trying to fix our relationships constantly, but in some way we have to go back to that original place and have that part of our hearts healed and restored and filled with the love that we never had. How in the world do we do that? And of course, this isn't just a, like a psychology 101 class, because all of that, what we've said so far, just is leading us to this basic question. It's the basic question we have in our lives. Okay, when it hasn't been all perfect, when everything hasn't been the way that it ought to be, what was that Matt Redmond song? You know, when the sun's shining two days a year in Manchester and the world's all as it should be, how good is that? But, but what do you do when it isn't like that? And, and, and so that's the primary question. When we find ourselves doing what we want, don't want to do and having results we, we, we hadn't hoped for and we realize it comes from a deep place, how can we do something about it? How can we see healing? How can we see change? When days like today cause us to come in contact with that pain, and very often, for many, we'll avoid groups, we'll avoid anything that will, will, will put us in touch with that deep sense of loss within ourselves, but when we are in that place, is there any hope for us? 
And when I say we, what we want to do is just briefly talk about three different strands of that we. One is, is there something that we ourselves can do to make healing possible? Secondly, does God care? Is there God, something that God can do? Is there something that God wants to do about these kinds of situations? And then third of all, because we often talk about our Christian family, our community, brothers and sisters, is there actually something real, tangible, that we can do that help restore this deep inner wound, that bring healing? Let's start with uh, what can we do when we're in that place of disconnection or loss or pain? What can we do to help make healing possible? Well, I've always said to my clients that it's three A's, awareness, acknowledgement, and acceptance. Um, so awareness is the most basic thing. If we're not aware of something, we can't change it. So basically, we need to be aware that loss exists in our lives, that there is disruption, okay? So it's acknowledging it for ourselves, that that is what is in our lives that it has brought pain, and then accepting that it is there. Um, that's not resignation. That's not saying, uh, you know, wonderful, let's carry that on. It's about saying, I accept that there is weakness, that I am vulnerable, that this has happened. Well, and, and, of course, what that does is counterintuitive to us. How many of us love weakness and vulnerability? Mm -hmm. Like, bring me to that place. I just want to be that place where I feel helpless and I feel in need. <laughs> and yet, what Scripture tells us is that's the great place. That's the place we want to get to. James, the brother of Jesus, put it this way. He said, you know, the proud can't access God's grace because there's, there's no way to let it in. He says, God gives grace to the willing humble. It's that willing acknowledgement. I'm in a place and I can't fix it. Uh, Jesus said it this way in, in this famous summary message we call the Sermon of the Mount. He said, you're blessed when you feel you've lost what's most dear to you. It's not a bad place. That's a place of great blessing because only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You see, God isn't distant saying, put it together and we'll talk. God is saying, just let me know that you can't put it together and I'm there. Right there. And that leads us into the second part of that three-stranded chord. What can we expect from God? And this is something that's hugely important because remember, the scripture has always been written from the perspectives of God people alive in their context. So uh, much of the language about God is gendered. But as any biblical scholar will tell you, God is not gendered. God is not he. God contains uh, all of that which we call paternal and all of that which we call maternal. It's the wellspring, the source of every way in which we express love and care. Even that, you know, we used the word Yahweh this morning, a Hebrew word uh, for, for the, uh, uh, the name of God that they couldn't even mention. It couldn't even, you know, it would be unholy to even mention his name. But there is the, 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 the phrase El Shaddai, the Almighty One. All, that's all through the Old Testament. El, of course, meaning the, uh, God, and then it's they're a descriptive. But it's interesting because the root to Shaddai can be mountain, but it can equally be breast. So there's this sense in which God is presenting as the strong breasted one, the nourishing God, the maternal God. And you know, you see that threaded through the Old Testament and the New. Yes, Moses will will talk about, uh, about uh, God like a... a a mother eagle protecting her young. Uh, what we'll see, we'll, I mean, Hosea will talk about a father teaching his son to walk. 
but he'll also refer to God as a mother bear protecting her cubs. Uh, Isaiah will, will use the image of a good shepherd, but there's also in Isaiah this incredible verse in Isaiah 66, 13, where, where God says, as a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. You see, every time a mother loves, that mother is drawing on the image of God, which is the nurturing love of a mother. That's the wellspring. That's the source. And so Jesus will, will talk about being born of the Spirit, which is an image of, of childbirth, a mother giving birth. Jesus will talk about to the people of Jerusalem, how many times I long to gather you as a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But there's one particular passage in Isaiah that gives us incredible hope, particularly in a place of confusion and loss and pain and, and disconnection from mothering love. And that's Isaiah 49, verse 15, that says, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? and have no compassion on the child she has born, though she may forget, I will not forget you. Um, so, you know, it is possible that mothers can neglect their babies, um, that they can, uh, well, it's hard to believe, but that can happen. But God says that he will not, he will not forget us. So God can reconnect us. With, with mothering love. You see, it does happen over and over again. It gets broken, it's lost. And what God is saying is, not only that God can, but God is saying, everything you need can be broken in your life. But my care for you, my heart for you, will never be broken. I will run after you. And what you didn't have but desperately needed, even though it seems impossible to add it in later, because I'm the source of it all, I can provide for you what was stolen from you. Or maybe I can restore and rebuild what you yourself squandered. I, I'm greater than the brokenness in every life. And that leads us to the third part. Well, can we be a part of that? Well, I, one author has described it this way, that this whole Christian thing is always intended to be a conspiracy of little Jesuses. If Jesus was really God breaking into this world and taking up the space, and not waiting for us, but coming to where we were, meeting us right where we were and saying, this is what the heart of God is, then we are simply to be that same taste of what God's heart is. So what God desires us to be is a tangible, living expression of that mothering, nurturing love that goes far beyond even handing out flowers, but sees the need and the longing and the brokenness in, in someone's inability to, to have any kind of real relationship. And we walk into that space and say, this is what love looks like. And we give them a taste of what their heart longs for. And the New Testament, Paul writing to a group of Christians called the Thessalonians said, hey, like, why did we come to you? And why were we gentle among you? just like a nurser, nursing mother nurtures her own children, because that's what love does. Love has impacted our hearts, and we care just like a mother cares. And that's the beautiful thing about it. Sin and brokenness has destroyed so much of the image of God in our relationships. But one by one, as love begins to take root, it grows and transforms and changes us. And then like a healthy virus and pandemic, it begins to touch the hearts and lives of others and awaken them. And I'm, I'm really, that's what psychologists understand. 
that the best therapy to bring about healing is not words. Well, not only words. So it's also experience. So it's, it's um, yeah, obviously talk therapy is, is wonderful and part of it. But it's also about um, going inward and um, I try to help my clients um, heal broken memories or, or uh, memories of pain by actually going back to that time and um, through various you know, methods, just helping them to get in touch with that pain and to, to be with that pain and to soothe themselves and to almost reimagine the situation um, that what they were in, but in a different way, with a different outcome. So uh, that's what we do in therapy, but I really believe that you know, God can come into those places and, um, and do his healing experientially, um, not just through words. And so God can do amazing things, and, and we know that. We know how God uh, can come and impact and, and encounter people uh, without any other kind of human contact. But that's not the way God prefers to work. God is about the bringing together of all things. And what God has always intended is we would be the embodied, nurturing love of God in the way that we touch one another. And so one of the powerful ways we can embody this and walk this out on a day like Mother's Day is not just talk about it and not even just bring a message of hope to say that God can bring to your heart what you lack. God can make up today what you didn't have 30 years ago and wasn't at the foundations of your life. What we can do is so far beyond that. We can actually connect the three. We can give opportunity for people to acknowledge and say, here I am in my vulnerability. And then we can invite God's presence right in that moment to say, oh Holy Spirit, would you come and bring this love of God to this deepest place? And then we can add the bridge we can have a circle of friends who come around that vulnerable one to let them know you are not alone in this. And with one hand reaching to them and one hand reaching to God, something is connected that not only touches us here and now, but can reach back far beyond what we would ever believe possible. That's part of why every time we come together, we try to make some space to say, are we in need?